Okay. Yes, ready. Compton Community College District Board of Trustees meeting. I call this meeting to order on November 19, 2024 at 5 11 p.m. 5 11 p.m. Oh, roll, uh, item 101, roll call, please. Trustee Thomas, Dr. Little, present. Uh, Trustee Sonia Lopez, excused absence. Trustee Monica Doppelmore, excused absence. Trustee Ramos? Present. President Calhoun? Present. Dr. Curry? Here. Item 2.01, approval of closed session agenda. And I have a motion. Second. Motion by Dr. Little, second by Trustee Ramos. Do we have any discussion? Dr. Little? No discussion. Trustee Ramos? President Calhoun, no discussion. Seeing no discussion, please place your online vote. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Item. Oh, sorry. That's a unanimous yes vote. Yeah. Item 3.01 request to address the Board of Trustees closed session agenda matters. Do we have any request to address the Board of Trustees on closed session agenda matters? No, we do not. Okay. <laughs> Item 302 Conduct Community College District Board of Trustees future agenda request. Trustees, do we have any future? Do we have any requests for future agenda items? Dr. Little? No, none at this time. Trustee Ramos? None for myself. Recess. Okay. Always say the wrong. Recess to close the session in accordance with the Ralph M. Brown Act, Government Code, Section 54950, and follow. And Education Code Section 72122 to discuss or take action on the following items. I will adjourn to close session at 5.13. No, I would get out. I hate to get Courts and sessions. But in the end, at the end, I will not be giving you any money to take care of your needs. <laughs> There you go. Roll call, please. Roll call. Present. Dr. Little, present. Trustee Lopez, excused absence. Dr. Doppelmore, excused absence. Trustee Ramos? Present. President Calhoun? Present. Dr. Curry? Here. Yeah, 502 and Pledge of Allegiance. Keep it on. Yeah, hi. Oh, 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and the Pursuant to government code section five four nine five seven forty one, 
nothing to my baby. Seven point oh one approval open session agenda. Dr. Curry, do we have any corrections or additions to the agenda? Oh, you know. Can mm -hmm. I have them? Oh, right. Hey, all right. Moved by Trustee Rommel, second by Dr. Little. Do we have any discussion? Student trustee talks. Um, no discussion, Dr. Okay, Dr. Lippman, discussion. Just a moment. You know, discussion, please place your online folks. Item eight request to address the board of trustees on agenda and non agenda matters. Pursuant to board policy 2350, public participation, this is an opportunity for members of the public to address the board of trustees on agenda and non agenda items. Each person will have three minutes. Lawrence Alvitri from Master Instructing Academy on a non agenda item. Good evening, my name is My name is Lawrence. I work for Master Instructing Academy, and we train students, both women and men, for commercial advisors license. I've been coming to the PAC meetings here for well over a year, and I I've been talking to a lot of individuals who are recently um, released. And I always thought, why isn't Hopkins College have uh, commercial driving trips here. So I did a little research and a uh, few uh, adult schools do have uh, classes as well as have community college. I want to speak to a young lady um, by the name of Veronica who is in charge of the admission and part of helping a course be set at that school. So with her resource, all the information that was taken for her to start that school there, uh, she said she'd be more than willing to give any information that the board might need. I also spoke to my boss. She's not here with the loss of her family, but she does um, have the business side of things and also the financial side to get trucks if we get approved. I also have spoke to Jay Kuhn and other parole officers, what the CDCR has um, our backs. And what better place to do it than Copley College? Second chances, you guys already have a FISC program. Sky, she's running it, the formerly incarcerated uh, students in transition. And I myself, I'm a former lifer. I served over 26 years on a life sentence. And I did get my license when I got out, and I've been doing pretty good for myself. So myself coming to the PAC meetings, it's a big deal because I'm able to share to the men and women coming out what they can do if they put the best foot forward. So I would like to propose a uh, course be brought to the to Hopkins College. Thank you for that. Thank you. We don't answer that. Thank you. <laughs> Somebody out there heard. So we'll leave that there. Are you there? No, I'm not you. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. We have a couple of extra. Oh, Deborah Askew on non agenda item. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Last month I addressed. We a few of the public relations ability to succeed the community with the pamphlet five years of success. Report to the community 2018-2023. Omitted from the report in 2018-2023, low VCC enrollment, low retention rate, low graduation. 
and campus to the gentlemen responded and built a return in the site for future high school students. Who wants to come here to that? Earlier this year, a $40 million bond was sold. <laughs> Congressman Maxine Waters gave $850,000 to renovate the planning school to the technology building. This language was also needed to justify to the voters, to the voters to approve a $200 million bond. The college has $151 million in general obligation debt. Now, at $200 million obligation debt. A $351 million in general obligation debt to be paid by the community. <clears throat> this board of trustees have failed the community for this college to thrive with an increasing debt. Increasing students, low retention rate, low graduation rate, and their continued support to this administration for this college to thrive. This board is not acting in the best interest of the voters for this college. As I stated before, you are not the solution, you are the problem. Good evening, Thompson Community, Trustee Board, Dr. Curry. I'm here to give an update on the Emily B. Park Holyfield Library. Um, Myself and Mr. Holyfield met with Dr. Curry a few weeks ago to get an update on the naming. I am here today to request an agenda item for the next December meeting um, for discussion and for vote for the Emily B. Park Holyfield signage to be placed outside of the building and also for Emily B. Hart Holyfield to be named in perpetuity. Additionally, um, the naming inside will be corrected as voted by the board in May to Emily B. Hart Holyfield. I'm happy to report on that. And so that will be restored. I haven't been given an exact date, but I'm pretty sure by the end of this year, 2024. Um, we're also looking forward to being able to sponsor three students Dr. Curry has informed us that the cost of one year of enrollment here at Compton College is $1,000. We'll be awarding each three students $1,000 each um, in the month of March 2025 in honor of women's history. The cost <coughs> by naming of the college will be fundraised by the Holyfield family and our church, Community Baptist Church. So the cost of the naming will not be incurred on the college. The college or the residents or the taxpayers won't have to pay for it. And we're hoping to get a really nice sign that you guys can use the announcements on it and put it down on the next slide. Also, I apologize for being here. So Mr. Hodges is downstairs. He says hello. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys. Have a good night. That was the last year. <laughs> item 802, Common Committee on Central Board of Trustees, Future Agenda Items Request. Trustee, do you have any requests for future agenda? Good instruction, Thomas. No, not at this moment. <clears throat> Trustee 
Uh, item number nine, Board of Trustees meeting minutes. 901. Minutes of the October 15, 2024 Board of Trustees meeting. Can I have a motion? Mm -hmm. Second. Moved by Dr. Little, second by Trustee Ronald. Do we have any discussion? Student Trustee Thomas. Please place your online vote. Item 10, reports from representatives and employee organizations, 10.01, Associated Student Government Report, Sky. I call Sky. to attend the Tasha Thanksgiving and the food was very good. So I just want to thank the district. Um, at the November 7th Academic Senate meeting was our last meeting. We approved the new Ethnic Studies 108 Chicana and Latina Feminism course, as well as BP 4100, a graduation requirement and degrees. And we also approved the Compton College Comprehensive Master Plan 2035, which includes our new mission statement as well. That was included in the November 15th summary of decisions through the district. In regards to student learning outcome processes, the academic senate was presented in really insights, information, and the team will only vote to potentially adopt the new process this Thursday at academic senate. Also scheduled for action voting items at our upcoming uh, senate meeting are academic senate recommendations for the collaborative governance review and recommendations report. Academic Senate bylaw revision team membership process, academic Senate goals, the women insights, and recommendations from the hiring fire position committee. Up for a first read at this Thursday is a draft of the combined civil by mandatory as well as optional checklist items. <clears throat> Due to student and some faculty concerns, uh, uh, during the academic Senate executive meeting with the district last Friday on November 15th. Um, we discussed potentially looking into possibly adopting our own ER 3415, which is immigration enforcement activities. Uh, during the conference council Monday, uh, I provided some information about our new non credit ESL 704 citizenship preparation course, which was just launched yesterday. <clears throat> I've also had conversations with um, our ESL instructor about potentially designing a high set preparation program, which will have four new non credit ESL courses. Of course, that will need to come to academics in a first for approval and then to the district. But I'm just letting you know it's just discussion right now, it's just in the works. So if you see it come, come down the pipeline, it's really just a heads. Um, we have had some issues with our Wi-Fi, and I want to thank the district for being so active for the beginning to it. That concludes my report, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. CC, item 10.03, CCCFE, Certificated Employees Report, Dr. David Chavez. 
Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Colleagues and the staff administrators and our community members, most importantly. Uh, so uh, just have a, an update to provide for uh, <clears throat> for y'all. I haven't, haven't been able to come, but I've had his um, RVP, Professor uh, Carlos uh, Mano, he come, um, as well as Chris and Nathan Lopez. But I just have a couple of comments to give you all an update, right? Um, so three things. Um, first, just in, in general, as, as the one of the one of the labor sites here on campus, right? Um, it's important for us to acknowledge that the, um, the, the since we last met, the election has happened, and now we have um, at the federal level um, a very anti-union administration coming in and, and a swing more towards the right. So for us as as labor. Uh, these are uh, are times that are both concerning, but also times for call to action and collectivity and building partnerships and building bridges uh, for the rights of workers here uh, in terms of our uh, faculty, but also all the workers here in our in our campus and, and in our community that we serve. So um, just kind of uh, first kind of saying that, acknowledging that uh, labor has a role to play. It always has a role to play. Um, historically, it's had a, had a role to play. Um, as a historian myself, the U.S. history, right, the role to play within civil rights and human rights um, and the rights of working people is having a dignified life. So um, we're, we're just kind of putting that out there that these are things that we're thinking of and, and we're uh, continuing to move in that direction as a as labor. Um, so again, one of the labor units around that list. Um, the second thing I wanted to bring up, uh, just give you an update on you know, where we're at with negotiations. I know that the uh, the board uh, trustees you all met uh, with labor relations. You do that before each meeting, and I just wanted to give you some additional information to help kind of give you the picture about where we're at and the and where we're trying to head with our labor negotiations. So um, I have a couple of documents just I want to pass out to the board of trustee members if that's okay. You don't care about this. Um, obviously, further. So. We've got two of our student trustees and our three trustees here as well. Um, um, so what you see in front of you is, and I'm sorry I don't have it for all the audience, but I can I'll just go ahead and do my best. Right, is that we have uh, a chart here, something we've been doing from the beginning, trying to compare us to the rest of LA County. Um, there's 13 different community college districts in LA County, and when we look at um, which we haven't talked about as much as our part-time faculty members, uh, a very important part of academic labor. A uh, majority of, of workers in terms of numbers of academic labor in LA County, we can see that Compton, just like our full-time faculty numbers are at the very bottom, unfortunately. Uh, we can see that uh, all the other districts uh, in our county have made progress uh, towards trying to improve uh, not only the wages, but also the uh, uh, the living conditions and, 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 the, and the conditions of their uh, of workers' families and their communities uh, by moving towards, you know, more towards the right and towards, uh, towards dignified wages, you could say. Um, unfortunately, we've been pretty stagnant, as you can see. Um, obviously, this is having to do with our, we haven't finalized our our um, our proposals and our, in, in our um, haven't finalized our bargaining agreement, but we are well behind the rest of our district, or sorry, the rest of our county. Um, at $44.79, uh, an hour as compared to some of our other colleagues, um, our closest campus being Long Beach, uh, which is now at $69.02, or um, South, uh, Southwest College, uh, part of the LA Community College District at $128.41 for um, starting off as a part-time faculty member. And I know um, um, something that guides the district, and I, I definitely, you know, in, in a right way guides uh, Dr. Curry, um, you know, as well as that budgets are a reflection of values. Right? What we invest uh, for our district is a reflection of, of, of how we see the students and how we see um, the values of the district being uh, wanting to be focused on. And unfortunately right now, the, the reflection of the our, our faculty salaries, again, a, a workforce that is, um, is unique to LA County in terms of majority of people of color, um, our, our Latino and African uh, American um, faculty members are unique as opposed to it, someone having myself having worked at multiple community colleges mm -hmm. that, um, that um, and also being able to serve the students that we serve right our, our, our unique service area as well mm -hmm. I think it's point a, a direction that we have to move in, in, in the right uh, direction in terms of our values I think we've done so uh, I know there's just a celebration today for our building 
uh, completion of uh, building, instructional building one and instructional building two, which is a great asset to support our students. Um, but I think the piece that's still missing here and what we've been um, bargaining at the table for is um, not just the exterior of the building, but then actually content on the inside of the building, which we're learning happens and knowledge is produced and students are moving towards their goals, both academically and career-wise. So I bring this here to, to let you know where, where we're at. As you can see where the district proposal is on the table, um, we are, we've we come down significantly. We, we have this current proposal, um, getting us towards, moving us towards competitiveness because it is hard to recruit and retain uh, um, faculty members uh, who are coming here on a part-time basis. It's very hard to retain this. I know that the, um, this is a, it's a high turnover rate. Um, I don't have the percentages here, but it is a big issue in terms of we want to recruit and maintain uh, uh, talented faculty members and also those first time part-time faculty members um, who are predominantly people of color as well. Um, and also coming from working class backgrounds too. So I think this is some of the points to that other North Star of our campus, which is equity. And when we look at these numbers, we don't really see it. Um, we're, uh, I'm, I'm bringing this up to the district's attention because, or sorry, the board of trustees. I've already brought this to the district, our bargaining team. I see many of the bargaining team members here. Um, and Dr. Curry, can we meet your for meeting uh, once uh, once a month now, which has been great to talk about these issues. Uh, but I do want to bring it here to the board of trustees. So let us know that right now we're being, we're, we're trying to come to the table, but uh, uh, sticking uh, to the district bargaining uh, team, sticking to uh, uh, and arguing over $6 an hour. Um, and not moving in the direction, I think is uh, uh, it's not what we should. Be. We should be able to. We should be able to move on this contract. We should be able to look at the reality of the economic situation um, for our workers and also our, our service community, and and come uh, and, and come with a, a proposal or come together on a proposal that will actually meet the cost of living adjustments and and um, the issues that our that faculty are facing. <clears throat> so. Um, Hoping just to provide you some more information because ultimately the board of trustees will sign off on the contract. We meet monthly with uh, the negotiating um, members. Um, so I just wanted to provide this. This is a big part of what we're talking about. I've only really been talking, you know, uh, presented information on our our full time salary uh, um, schedule, but it's important um, to talk about our, our part time faculty members as well. So I wanted to present that, and, and again, you know. You just kind of underscore the way I started. that budget is our reflection of the values of the district. So let's uh let, let's demonstrate not only to our service area, LA County, but to the to the world that we are um have a we value the knowledge that's being produced in our classroom, the labor of our of our of our workers, uh counselors, librarians, uh teaching faculty, our non-credit faculty, um, and our certificated um, vocational faculty in, in serving our community. And then the last piece uh, um, I wanted to, to say, which is uh, something that um, has been coming uh, to our attention as faculty members as well, um, it's something that we've been discussing in um, uh, as uh, the executive board of, uh, of the faculty union, and it was actually just mentioned by um, my colleague Professor Moore, um, which is the the question of the response by the district um, to um, the. The, the impending or what will be coming down the pipeline in terms of uh, immigration policy. Um, uh, I know we met with Council State of Council, um, and we, we we know that, and, and, and Dr. Curry let us know that they, uh, they're kind of waiting right now to see what's going to be happening, and I understand that perspective. Uh, I think it's important to note that for the Federation um, is that we have a different perspective as well. We think we have the tools and ability to um, uh, implement a policy that will send a strong message to our, our service area, which is anywhere between 30 to 40 percent of foreign born um, uh, peoples. Uh, LA County itself um, has a large percentage uh, of immigrant communities, including uh, one out of every three African uh, African peoples or African Americans that are living in in, uh, in Los Angeles County has a member of their family or their family unit uh, is being an immigrant as well. So this is not a, a one a one ethnic group uh, issue, but it's a multi ethnic issue around immigration. And so, um, and the reason I say we have the tools available, is because the counselor's office on uh, on the fifteenth of this month sent out a, uh, a legal advisory to districts 
uh, specifically California's community colleges remain sanctuary jurisdictions. And so we have a lot of really good evidence, uh, sorry, evidence guidance from the chancellor's office. We also have our, uh, our sibling campuses or sibling community college districts like um, LA Community College District, Citrus College, and some of the other ones that have passed board policies that um, that that comport with uh, the law, but also send a strong message that our campus is a welcoming institution and that um, if we do it in, in other parts as well, we, I think it's, it's only consistent, right, that our, our district has constantly said in its, uh, in its uh, outfacing language to the community that this is a this is a place for everyone to feel safe and to learn and to feel respected and, and have a dignified access to education and, and their career. And so we are really trying to push the district um, or the board of trustees to think to think about this um, instead of um, the current stance right now, which is to to wait and see what's going to happen on, on January 20th is to be proactive um, rather than reactive. I think this is a great opportunity for, for our district to do that. And we have guidance uh, in, in, uh, both from the chancellor's office at the state level, but also our, our, our sibling campuses. I know immigration uh, advocacy right, is, a, is a part of um, part of something that some members here of the Board of Trustees have been a part of. Um, and overall, what our campus has done a great job at, we have a, uh, uh, an adopt-you-ally uh, work, work group that's been working on these issues. So it only makes sense, I think, to pass a board policy um, that is again, that is uh, instead of reactive, it's proactive. So I just wanted to kind of add that voice. I know other people have already probably spoken about that too. And um, yeah, I look forward to um, uh, continuing to work with the district, our board trustees. Um, hope to see you all next month as well. Uh, final thing is congratulations to uh, those who ran for office. And still here, we like to <laughs> congratulations. Uh, congratulations. Uh, um, so, um, and also congratulations to the districts on patching measure CC as well. Um, and so and thank you to the, to the people of our service area. And I'm assuming some people here probably voted for that. Um, and so I think it's just a, it's a great asset to start investing in the community is showing its love to uh, to our districts. And I don't think it makes sense for, for us to do the same um, and in fact to our board policy. Okay. So thank you all so much and you all have a good rest of the classified employee report back on McKenzie. Oh, I'm going to be that good. Grab the tennis So our first thing. I think I'm going to all come to y'all where to go. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Y'all want to give me y'all. Okay, y'all. Okay, y'all. Vision, the Thompson College deep speak to who we are, the summit proceeding, some of the keynote speakers that we were able to engage with, also the cultural experiences that we have, as well as Sankofa. We'll talk about what that means because it's important for everyone to be grounded in what we're going to be discussing in the next few minutes. Also, some of the key findings and recommendations for future engagement. Next slide, please. All right, so I'm here to introduce to you what Sankofa means. So Sankofa means to go back and get it. And so what we decided to do, or what we got the opportunity to do, to do rather, was to go to, well, faculty, teachers, 
all kinds of uh, classified professionals, uh, policymakers, academic advocates. We all united on the continent to really continue the work that we do to empower our communities and to empower our students. And so these systems that we came to challenge, we unfortunately sometimes uphold. And so we took the opportunity to really examine what we do, how we do that, and how we influence change and how we serve the students that are here in Compton and at Compton College. So I don't know if you all know of this saying, but it says, if you know where we're from or where we've been, you know how far we've come. And so this summit allowed us to reflect, challenge, strategize, and create spaces that we will utilize to reimagine how we teach, influence, serve, and dare I say, love our students here. Next slide, all right, and so our informal or formal introduction, I'm just going to ask my colleague by name to please stand up in front of the board members. So Devorah Say, she's representing our classified professional. Mm -hmm. All right, we also have Seku. Seku, right here coming to the front, please, so they can see. He's representing our classified professionals, and we have Jose Estado, representing classified professionals. To represent our faculty, we have Ms. Bria Roberts, Everybody. We had Linda Wilkerson. And then last but not least, we had Echo Blake. And then we had our amazing students to join in the journey. We had Ashley Bishop. We also had our trustee, Shaniqua, in the back here. <laughs> and then I topped it off with myself here, uh, Dr. P. Next slide, please. So to talk more about the descriptive details of what happened when we engaged in the summit, we'll have Bria discuss that later. All right, so during the experience or during our conference, there was an amazing, con or excuse me, roll con. So that's where we got to find out who was in the space, the faculty, the uh, classified professionals, uh, all of our administrators and all that. So it was real loud. We learned how to do some dances and all that great stuff. It was real cute. And then we had, of course, the panel discussion. Now, this is where it came down a little juicy, right? So we talked a lot about the impact of colonization on education, what that does to the spirit of students who might identify as African or indigenous. Uh, and then we also talked about the dangers of actually utilizing colonized education practices or colonized curriculums for these spirits that are for these individuals that have a spirit that we have not touched. And so with that, what we were saying or what we have experienced was <clears throat> that we really had to talk about how to decolonize these spaces. And what we also don't address, but we got the chance to address at this conference was how we look at decolonization with rose color lenses, right? We think it's beautiful, we think it's fun, it's exciting, but this is where the real work comes in. And that's where we had to have those really nitty gritty conversations. So we talked about decolonization in the classroom from K to 12, higher education, and even in nonprofit organizations, because if we all know, if we receive money from somebody and they say how we spend it, that's how we have to spend it, right? So how do we challenge those ideas, those notions, and everything else that upholds a colonized educational system? All right, so then next, I want to talk about what we really did. So when we talk about being at a conference, you might think that we just sit and listen to people speak. No, we engage in our five senses. So I want you to imagine, if you close your eyes right now and you imagine the sight, we were there amongst vibrant places, colorful people, colorful attire, natural landscapes, okay? Also the sounds. Every time we went to anything related to this conference, there was always the beautiful sounds of drums and you can just feel the vibrations in your spirit. Also, the languages. There are so many different languages there that we were able to engage in. For, for the beginning to the end, when we said good morning, when we said hello, when we said thank you, we were engaging in Guyana talk, right? Also, the sounds of nature, how beautiful it is to actually hear the birds and to see them. It is it's unlike any other state that you could ever imagine. Also, when you touch the fabrics and the garments that they use are different than what we see here. All right, and when we touched the, the fabric that they had, they were so amazing. And to see the people actually putting them on your bodies, right? A lot of the pieces that we're wearing, they were custom made to us. And I think that was special. Also, the natural elements, again, when we had things like the uh, mango or the 
pineapple. We actually saw where they were growing. We saw them fall from the tree. We saw these things. And just to be in that space was amazing. Next, the tea. Traditional dishes in Ghana are unlike any other. Um, the fish, freshly caught fish. I mean, every single thing that we ate was fresh. Okay, I cannot emphasize that enough. Again, the smell, the spices, seeing the street food. I mean, it's one thing to see the street food here in LA, but when you're in Ghana and you see these women walking around the streets with fresh donuts and just fresh banana chips and just fresh fruits that you know that they actually can prepare that morning is special. And then the tropical floor, imagine the beautiful trees and the scenes and the things that you have never seen in your life. I mean, you haven't seen a palm tree, but you've seen one in Africa. Next slide, please. And then when you think about Sankofa, there's a share out that we're going to engage in as a group very briefly. Each member will share the experience that you see before you on that screen. There's five components on that. We connected with the culture. That means that we were connecting with the people of that native land, but also with our ancestors, those of us who are of African descent. Next, we went to actual villages and we were engaged in a naming ceremony. Imagine that. We now have African names that were granted to us from actual tribes. Museums. We went to museums that were unlike any other. Some of the museums that we went to actually are burial sites for those people who we visited. We also went to sacred spaces. These spaces required us to take our shoes off because the land was used way back when our ancestors had to travel from Africa to other places to now become totally different, right? And then last but not least, the higher learning component. We went to the University of Ghana, where we not only saw people from Ghana, but we engaged in dialogue with people from nations all across the continent. What a beautiful space to see. More than 19 countries represented in one university. Right? So cool. And last but not least, we did a group project where we represented Compton College to let them know that the work that we're doing at our campus is transformational, not just there in the continent, but we do this work when we're here on the ground in Compton. All right? And so now if we can go ahead and just share out what you learned in your stand photo. We'll start with Deborah. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, I'm going to speak about higher learning. Um, Compton College regards itself as an institution of diversity and inclusivity. But could we be doing our students a disservice by not allowing academic programs that encourage cultural inclusivity and also invigorate their spirits to achieve their goals? For example, my visit to the Ebe village in Ghana for the naming ceremony was life changing. It was warm and welcoming. The entire village was invested and shared in all of us receiving our African name and all of us being accepted as members of the tribe. And that's what we need to have last year. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to thank all the wonderful groups for something very good. And uh, I got given the opportunity to travel to the Netherlands. And I was able to connect with the African culture. As a Mexican, it was a life changing experience. The people in Africa possess a natural ability of being humble, friendly, and always ready to serve their guests. They open their arms to Welcome anybody. <laughs> they call us our brothers and sisters, and they let all and they let all African descendants here in America know that the Africa, that Africa is their home, and they belong there. So it was something really good. And thanks again. Hello, everybody. I'm Ashley Quigley. So I'm going to be presenting a village visit. Um, visit. The name of ceremony was a very inspiring experience. The name I was given was Ajo Ebo Gamali. It means Monday born, second female born from Gabe Gume clan and time for everything. This resonated with my life on a deeper level. My wishes for every African descendant to go back to the motherland to find out their real name other than their slave name. Being in the presence of a chief and belonging to a village was an experience that I will never forget. Knowing that I have a home away from home, I will never forget that Compton College was the reason I went back to my homeland. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Excuse me. I'll be talking about the museum. So we visited the W.E.B. Du Bois Center, mm -hmm. and it offered a deeply enriching experience for all of us. 
It showcased the life of the first African American to earn a PhD from the University of Harvard. So that's the point. Okay, so his center is filled with memorabilia, including um, you know, his personal book, okay, and also his thesis on the suppression of the African slave trade. The boy is also a key figure in the pan African movement. Okay. He also worked as, alongside Dr. Kwame Narama, who you've been we also visited, and uh, he was also Ghana's first president. He helped to inspire African leaders and freedom fighters. His museum house, the statue, which symbolized his motto, forever, I'm sorry, forever, backward, never, which means always look forward, never look back. Okay? And it also serves as, as the final resting place. And I just appreciate Compton College for allowing me to experience that. The motherland is just a wonderful experience for me after, for the group as well. <clears throat> One of the uh, experiences that resonated with me was the conceptual way. And touched me in ways that was somewhat like this one. <clears throat> it, it was spiritually um, amazing. And I'm grateful to Compton College that we're able, you know, to take such a trip because we were able to like actually connect with our people in Africa and, and be able to learn things that I wasn't expecting to learn. You know, um, I learned you know, the, the, the uh, summit. It was um, it was enlightening, and um, I'm just grateful that I had the experience to go. Thank you. Hello. I'm going to speak on the sacred spaces of Lena Castle. Um, the Nima Castle was a good experience um, for slave dungeons that housed a uh, slave. It's estimated that anywhere from 10 million to 12 million slaves were sold during the 300 years of Nima was in operation by various European countries. And this is the largest um, operative slave dungeon um, in that part of Africa. Um, it was a really um, very emotional experience for most of us on the excursion. And what this experience taught me is that the atrocities known as the transatlantic slave trade, um, this is a global historical event. And it needs to be shared, it needs to be addressed, and it needs to be embraced. Um, it says that um, the captives were mostly from Western Central Africa with disembarking in the Americas and the Caribbean. And various European uh, countries, the Dutch, the Portuguese, the British were all involved. So this is a worldwide issue. So um, it was great to experience that with our colleagues and um, something that we need to care for, something that we need to embrace, and something that we need to be um, just known how it affects um, humans worldwide, okay? not just persons of African ancestry. <laughs> So I had decided to speak about the um, higher learning for the University of Ghana. And uh, so what I wanted to share was uh, as we venture into an era of I don't know if it's what we know it will be for these next few years, um, I wanted to share that the two with decolonization and these rose-colored lenses, they often dance together. And so what I learned from the University of Ghana is that it, we can't allow them to dance, right? We can't allow them to be, to coexist. And so it's not enough to see oppression and place a band-aid over the issue. I learned that whether it's the responsibility of the, excuse me, it's the responsibility of the institution to call to order the change that's influencing a campus culture that does not draw, or excuse me, that does not divide, rather it unites, that does not oppress, rather it empowers, and not one that just teaches, but that equips students with what they need or what they're seeking and what employers and individuals are looking to have the ability to access. And so it's our job to assess and to allow students to assess themselves, what we bring to the table, and how to address us moving forward as a community versus just individual groups. Next slide, please. All right, so our key findings 
that stood out to us that the collective first and foremost critical examination of African representation is necessary. So by creating an awareness of cultural and historical narratives of African identities, I think that that will continue to support all of our students, but particularly our students of African descent. Next, the commitment to social justice. By promoting a strong focus on social justice through guiding faculty, classified professionals, and administrators to address inequities in their work is the focal point of one of the findings. Next, indigenous and culturally relevant methods. So the mention of the drums is very important because as mentioned, each and every activity that we did, we started with music and ended with music. Music is very important to people at the descent, but also all types of cultures love music. And so why not infuse that in what we do, right? That's one method. Uh, last but not least, cultural appreciation. Understanding the value of culture. Culture is not a race. Culture is a person. And so learning how to embrace people and appreciate and see that as a value is key. And so we believe to continue that is something that we're doing here at Compton, but we want to continue to get lots of it to Next slide, please. Recommendations for future engagement. Before I start, I do want to let the trustee um, speak about um, something. So, I'm sorry. Okay, um, I just want to speak about um, this opportunity. So um, thank you to the board. Thank you, um, Dr. Curry, for allowing us to share this experience with one another. Um, this opportunity granted me access to meet and connect with my ancestors and to gain a fuller understanding of history. Um, their history is beyond um, the history and the narrative of slavery. Um, we should know more. We should share it. Um, we should, uh, it gave me a, a stronger sense of identity and pride. That's what Africa did for me. And I thank you for that. And I thank my, myself for allowing to be in that vulnerability and be in that moment. Um, my journey from the National Ghana Museum down to the Elmina Dungeons was overwhelming or brought me closer to my ancestors. The walk from the last bath, um, barefoot was just, um, very emotional um, for me. Um, we all want to say thank you for allowing us to have this experience as individuals, but mostly important as a group. We are the G group and the GC crew um, of 2024. Thank you for allowing us to go to Africa. Um, I brought you back your gifts. And I brought, since Dr. Curry, everyone knows that Dr. Curry writes his own newsletter. I got him <laughs> a newsletter from Africa from the Elmina Dungeon. Um, and also, um, you being an uh, African American, I brought you a little black boy because this could happen too. So as as we continue to to move forward with the rest of the presentation, just some of the recommendations for future engagement that we saw as a group: having physical space for students, faculty, and classified professionals to interact, so that we can embrace and value each other and our differences amongst the cultures that we have here as a, as a unit, as, as a collective. Next, culturally relevant connection. It seems that use of music and dance, that's something that should just be ignored. And when we talk about music, let's be honest. How many of you either go home or go to your car? What's the first thing you do, right? All right, so music is important. So we need to learn how to embrace that and connect that with the spirit of the person. And then last but not least, physical representation of the students and families in this community. Beautiful cultures, beautiful lives, beautiful values that we bring. We just want to continue to embrace it as we do here at Compton College. Thank you for this time. Thank you for the script about this curve. You don't know how much it changed us, how much it humbled us, and how much we have grown as a collective. And with that, we want to go ahead and end it. Yes, and we want to make sure that uh, more students can go within two years. So we need to come up with funding to make sure more students can go. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't get to show everyone that was so rude. I'll be coming. Yeah, that's a so who was that the meeting? I'm not afraid I'll say you better bring some of that. There you are. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm sorry. Any other questions? I think first of all, I want to thank you guys so much for the presentation. Thank you, Dan, administration, and faculty, and the board, and the 
Um, I think this has been very transformational and powerful. Um, so many takeaways. What I loved was the notion of the collective spirit of this trip for everyone, that it wasn't for one group or another group, that it was about humanity and bringing the point of example, slave trade and colonization, physical initially when you talk about language, people have fights about speaking, we can't both go to colonizing languages, none of them are English. So when you think about who's speaking what language, if English came to the U.S., hence English, the Spanish came to the U.S. and other parts of the world, hence Spanish. And so I just think that not only is this an uplift, but it reminds us of how much we have to continue to learn as we are talking about how do we embed this. And, and my one question was, in addition to the music, um, would love to hear in future for me how that is embedded in some of the actual practices of classrooms, student support, student engagement, or what other retentions that we sometimes don't know. Um, I apologize, sir, your, your, your name again? Jose. Jose. As Jose was speaking, I thought about how many people don't know their pyramids in Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't know about the history of the African and the indigenous folk before the line was moved, you need to go and look at the structures and the ceramics. And it'll help us modern day when people create divisions. But it's not accidental. So when we don't know our history, history doesn't repeat itself. Human beings repeat history. Mm -hmm. So I just want to thank you all for embodying that. And again, thank you, Dr. Curry, because as always, whether people know it or not, Compton College is always at the forefront mm -hmm. of innovation. Yes, we have lots to do. We have a lot of space to grow. But please do not minimize the impact of opportunities and the work that's being done. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll just make it quick. Um, th thank you for that lovely presentation. <laughs> I thought it was all beautiful. I was waiting for the music to come back on. We were told this is a professional thing. Yeah, we, got, yeah. we got called out in Africa. <laughs> We represented Compton in Africa. The videos. Yeah. We have videos to prove it. Yeah. Oh, the oh, first team oh, was just saying you shiny played, white. You played, <laughs> the, you played the music when you first was coming up. I thought you were going to go. I was trying to. You're going to. And you and music is the soul. Music yeah. is for everybody. And you're exactly yeah. right. We know doggone well. Every time I get in my car, when I leave here, I don't know if y'all hear, but my music is like, not, okay, I'll be going boom, boom. You can hear my speakers go boom, boom, you know. So music is the dance of life. Music is what we hear. Music embodies all of us. Music runs through our soul. So that was a great report. Thank you. I'm glad y'all enjoyed it. And in two years, you got a great voice. We need to send some more. Come on now. <laughs> we just got to figure out how to raise the money. Yeah. Out the no. I just want to say one last thing. Many people don't know when we talk about Christopher Columbus, mm -hmm. it was a Ghanaian navigator right. who brought him over here. So he couldn't find it by himself. Right. But it tells you also that Ghanaians have been coming mm -hmm. to this space. And so the beauty of that exchange is so wonderful. Mm -hmm. So meeting a eleven oh two. Yeah, so now we have our new enrollment presentation. Now I'd like to introduce uh Dr. Rebecca Bonshine to introduce our sisters today. <laughs> We love the woman Robin. Okay, we have Darlene 
Tarazu, who is our interim director of education. Good evening, board of trustees and members of the public. I am here to go over to enrollment. I unfortunately do not have an intro or up to a song. We do have a day to support all of the great work that we're doing that will get. So our table talking for today, I'm going to briefly go over the different dual enrollment programs that we have available here at Compton College, briefly touch on how we do this through a multi-department collaboration. Again, touching into a little bit more deeply what that type of dual enrollment program is, as well as highlighting the data for every particular program. And then lastly, touch on the early outreach that we began, and then what our updates are as of right so again, dual enrollment at Compton College, we, of course, K-12 students the ability to benefit from concurrently enrolling in college classes while still in high school to minimize the equity gap for access. One thing that I also want to point out here, um, a recent study by Secrets College Columbia stated that roughly 2.5 million U.S. high school students participated in dual enrollment, and this represents largely about 20% of our overall community college enrollment. And I'm going to briefly touch into you where that data looks like here at Compton College. So again, we would not be able to afford these opportunities to our students if it wasn't for the multi-department collaboration that we have ongoing. So I do want to highlight some of the main stakeholders that we have here at our campus. First, beginning with academic affairs, building that curriculum for what dual enrollment programs we will offer our high schools, our partner districts, and overall really seeing what our students want at the forefront of their education. Next, we go into faculty assignments, right? Also going over how we support our faculty and what pedagogical practices they can implement in their teaching to support high school students in that process. Also going into the progress reports, how are our high school students performing in class? Are they succeeding? Are they retaining their coursework? Next, with admissions and records, supporting us with the registration of those students and then also by posting grades. Next, our counseling and guided pathways. We also ensure that every student has an educational plan available to them. So we do have a part-time guided pathway counselor that is assigned to different high schools where they are updating educational plans consistently, ensuring that our students only know where they're currently at in the process, but that they also have an educational plan at the end of their dual enrollment program and beyond as well. Next, going over distance education, where we also connect with some of the stakeholders, which is mainly Alistair, <laughs> ensuring that students don't have any um, technical issues, such as them not being able to look on the campus or anything like that as well. Here is where my department comes in largely, where we support a lot of our high schools with application, admission, admission application workshops, as well as onboarding their students, ensuring that they're having my confidence set up, that they're properly registered in the courses that they submitted requests for. Next, we going over student support services right, so ensuring that every single student has the support that they need. And we do this by identifying what support they would most benefit from. We do that by offering early alert follow up where every single dual enrollment specialist has their weekly dual enrollment meetings where they go over where some of our strength areas are in dual enrollment. They highlight some of the comments that these centers have submitted and moreover what support or assistance we have on campus to support them and closing out that alert as well. We partner with student basic needs by offering equity emergency grants where we identify that students once they're eligible to receive these funds that they properly get the grant funds that they can be afforded with. And then lastly with the student success center where we partner with various different high schools across our district to offer extended tutoring services at their high schools. One of the examples in which we do this is one of our districts highlighted that a lot of their students were struggling with their math scores and how we can go ahead and provide services offsite. Very quickly, the message to the inside center said we previously been able to offer tutoring support offsite. What are the main times that you can send someone out there or that can take them support if you opportunities without them having to come to campus with any questions? All right, so now I am going to touch into the types of dual enrollment. So we mainly have five different dual enrollment programs and then also six with our public board initiative. So our first one is our regular K 12 program, which I'll touch. I'll touch on each program individually, just highlighting the first five. The second one is our afternoon college program. The third one is our Compton Early College High School. 
our 14 or 8028 or college and career access pathway CPAC program. And then our fifth one is an instructional service agreement with the California Academy of Math and Science, for example, which is the legal aid on the public. So, first, starting off with regular K 12, what it is is essentially open to any high school student who is not part of an agreement with one of our K 12 school districts. So, this can be a student who may be at the USD or any other student across California or even across the nation as well. These students may enroll in any class except activity-based physical education courses, but this also excludes sports. Lastly, the main area that we, I want to focus on for our regular K-12 is that we do not directly engage these students and we do not directly provide that follow-up assistance where we've identified that maybe a student may be struggling in class because unfortunately we may not have an MOU with that district. So again, we offer the support by being able to assist them with admission application workshop and also ensuring that they're properly registered in that course. The next program that we have is our afternoon college, which is essentially courses that are offered at our junior high schools, but these courses are open to all students, right? So first we wanna ensure that our partner high schools have the ability to recruit and enroll the maximum number of students that they can, but these courses are open to the general Compton College population. The next program is our Compton Early College High School, where these students may earn an intersegmental general education transfer curriculum, or they get see at the end of their Compton Early College studies, where they also have the opportunity to learn an Associate of Arts in General Studies, Several students also end up accumulating several units to also earn additional AA degrees as well. These courses are open to all students at Compton Early College specifically. I want to take a moment so that I can go over some of that data that we have recorded on this slide. What you'll see on here is our 9th through 12th grade grading levels where you will see two different barcodes and these will be the same barcodes that are displayed across all of the different slides. So. The numbers that are displayed in blue are students that are officially registered in courses, where the numbers that are reported in red are those registration attempts. So one thing that I do want to highlight is that a student can have multiple different registration attempts based on the different courses that they are submitting registration requests for, right? An example of this will be a student that submits a, re a registration request for English and math. So again, those numbers are reported accurately on here. So we have been consistently growing in this area. In fall 2023, our ninth grade population was at 152. As of right now, our ninth grade population at Compton Early College is 162 students, so we're up by 10. And then for our 10th grade, our fall 2023 class was 152. This year, we're up at 166, so up 14 students. In fall 2023, our 11th grade population was 122, where this year, fall 2024, we're at 141. And then our 12th grades were up uh, to 134 this year. So you'll see that overall, we have a total enrollment of 581 students at Compton Early College, registering in 1,027 registrations. Bye. And then I am going to highlight now our 8288 or our CCAP pathway. So what this is, is essentially a series of college courses that may lead to an identified guided pathway. These courses are offered at our the local high schools that we have this um, partnership with, and they're integrated into the student's regular high school schedule. So these students can take that class either in first period or at the end of their regular high school day. For these courses, they're closed to other students, meaning that they cannot enroll if they are not in that specific program. Some of the participating districts that we have this 8288 program with is Compton Unified, Paramount Unified, and Linwood Unified. Our next, um, now I'm going to highlight each individual um, high school within the 8288 program. So you'll see on here that we have Compton Unified, who is on the Night Getsy pathway. What you see listed on those bars are the numbers for every specific high school that we have at Compton Unified. The first one being Compton High School, second being Centennial, and the third one being Dominguez High School. Again, you see that we have several students submitting registration requests. And then the students in the right actually being students that have previously started the process to do to enrollment, but unfortunately at some step of the way, meaning that they either were not able to get parent consent on time or counselor consent were not able to officially register in those courses. For this specific slide, I do want to point out that 
for our three districts in fall 2024, we have increased by 35 students at Compton High School. At Dominguez High School, we increased by 19 students. And at Centennial High School, we've increased by 28 students. Next slide. This slide is our 8288 agreement at Linwood Unified. So these numbers represent our numbers at Linwood High School and Vista High School. What you see again listed in the blue are a number of students registered. Number of students across Linwood High School and Vista High School is 130. Um, and then the students who initiated the process was at 146. So we retained a large portion of those students. What you'll see listed all the way to the far right are our students at Vista High School. And then in the middle is our students that are in our afternoon college programs. This is our Firebell High School. So you'll see to the left side of that that we have 136 students at 8288 programs at Firebell High School. And we have on the right side um, 125 students that are participating in afternoon. And then lastly, we have our 8288 program at Paramount Unified. This is specifically with our administration of justice pathway. These students have indicated an interest in receiving an administrative administration of justice degree at the end of their 8288 tenure. What you'll see listed on here are our programs at two different high school sites. The program on the right is our Paramount High School senior campus. And our program on the right is our Paramount West Campus, which is our ninth and chain So this year, I do want to highlight that we increased our 8288 program within the district by 41 students. This also is largely due to the fact that we are offering dual enrollment courses at Buena Vista and at Odyssey High School, which are also included in these counts as well. Next slide. And then lastly, we have our California Academy of Math and Science Instructional Service Agreement. These students are on a pre-engineering instruction route where they are earning units for their um, certificate in engineering technician. We last year offered 13 courses to CAMS. This year, we actually increased our courses to 15. What you see in that table down below is the number of students that started the process for dual enrollment, which is that 536 students. And then on the left side, you see the number for students that have successfully registered. One thing that I do want to point out here is that although we have 439 students being counted in this, this does not include the number of registrations that they have. So we are actually increasing in course registrations, and I do have that updated number here, where we have students enrolled in 886 sections, and eight, sorry, representing 886 course registrations. So for 439 students, we do want to essentially state that not only are they enrolling in these kinds engineering courses, but they're also taking the advantage to enroll in several other courses across the high school as well, across the campus site. All right, so then I am going to touch on now what our course registrations look like within our partner districts. So the slide goes over our accurate counts for the fall 2024 semester. So you'll see Compton Unified composing of Centennial High School at 192 course registrations, Compton High School at 220 course registrations, the Mingus High School at 280 course registrations, and lastly, our Compton Early College High School, which has 1,057 active course registrations. For Linwood Unified, we have broken it down between Fireball and Linwood High School, where Fireball represents 151 course registrations, and Linwood Unified, 173 course registrations. For Paramount Unified, which includes Paramount High School, both senior campus and West Campus at 183, and then lastly, our California Academy of Math and Science Instructional Service Agreement students. So the students that are officially in engineering courses at 536 for a grand total of 2,792 course registrations. All right, so now I'm gonna dig even deeper into dual enrollment data by highlighting some of the institutional set goals that we meant for the last academic year. So for the 2023-2024 academic year, you saw that Dual enrollment represented a very large portion of our population at 2,321 or 31.5% of our enrollment. And then what you see listed on the bottom is the grand totals for the overall enrollment at Compton College, which includes the general student population. So on the little check mark below, you'll see that we met our institutional set goal of 1,518 students. Bye. 
And then this briefly touches on what that dual enrollment headcount looks like divided by gender and ethnicity. This was a request made to the board last um, board presentation of November 2023. So we wanted to ensure that you all had accurate data reported to you based on some of the feedback that we received last year. So you'll see that female students composed about 1,299 of those course registrations, whereas male students represent 972. What you also see is that we have progressively grown dual enrollment um, for both female and male students consistently over the past five years. What's mm -hmm. listed on the bottom portion of that are the different um, ethnicities that we report out to, right? So for Black or African American students, they are representing 179 of those course registrations. And then for Hispanic Latino, 1,829. And all other ethnicities, we may be those that often go unreported, right? Or uncounted, being that students hold multiple different ethnicities, we have those represented at 313. And then the next slide goes over some of that success and retention data. So first I do want to define what the success is versus what um, retention is here at Compton College. So for the success rate, we have it as the percentage of students who receive a passing rate in a course, where the retention rate is the percentage of students who do not withdraw or drop courses, right? So you'll see for the dual enrollment success that we closed out in the 2023 and 2024 academic year, we had it representing at 82.1%, whereas the general Compton College population is succeeding at 66%. So we're seeing that dual enrollment students do perform much higher on average with their success rate. For our dual enrollment retention, we closed out 2023-2024 with 93.8% in comparison to the general Compton College population of 84.9%. So again, both the success and retention rate are very strong indicators that we are succeeding in our dual enrollment program, but that we're also retaining the students that are initially marked interest in it. Mm -hmm. The next slide goes over again, something a little bit deeper for the gender and ethnicity. So what you see represented on these graphs are the dual enrollment success in comparison, again, to the general population. So you'll see that females perform much higher on average than the general student population, as well as males. Black or African American as well, and Hispanic Latino. I do have um, some several points to make regarding this specific table. The highest data points that I do want to focus on is that we grew in male enrollment from 76% to 81%, which was due to a 5% increase. And then for Black or African American, we grew from 69% to 75.2%, representing a 6% increase within the past academic year as well. And the next data touches on that retention aspect. So you'll see again that um, females are performing um, at a much higher rate than um, the general population, as well as males. And then we also have Black or African Americans performing at a much higher rate than um, the general population, as well as Hispanics, with the highest rate that we're comparing it, 80%, which is the Black or African American population. And then what we have on here was, again, an ask from the Board of Trustees from November 2023 board presentation, where they asked us to represent what the dual enrollment counts look like in comparison to our high school districts, right? So are we actually enrolling a representative population of students that in comparison to the high school? So you'll see two graphs on here. The left side represents the dual enrollment male participants in comparison to our high school partners male population. And on the right side, you'll see our high school partner female participant um, in comparison to our high school female population. So you'll see that on the left side, we represented 2% um, of the Black or African American students, which is represented at 6% throughout our high school partners, where in contrast, we were representing 32% of that 44% for our Hispanic and Latino students in comparison to our dual enrollment program and their high school population. To the right side of that, you'll see the female population where we are representing a much higher um, percentage for Hispanic Latino, and then um, a similar percentage for both Black or African American student females. And then we would not be able to do this without the invaluable support that our dual enrollment specialists mm -hmm. support us with. So again, every single week they do manage early alerts. They have the responsibility to log on to CRMFIs, download lists of available alerts that are updated either weekly or daily. They not only digest the alerts right, so do that qualitative data, see where their students are struggling in, find those support systems, but they also communicate with our partner districts where some of their students are either falling behind or where some of their students are also succeeding so that we, again, provide that proper support. 
The next thing that they also do is refer students to tutoring and academic services. They also refer students to basic needs support. Once they've identified that a student may not have their basic needs met or a student has disclosed that they have other worries in their personal life that may be affecting their academic progress, they also partner with support um, programs and services on campus. They do registration checks where they're supporting their high school partners with knowing active course registration, as well as active point withdrawals. And they do this through weekly high school site visits as well. And then um, some of the early outreach that we began in the spring 2024 um, was providing middle school outreach. So we began to do a lot more in-class presentations with our elementary schools that went all the way up to sixth grade so that they knew that once they started middle school, that was something that their students could benefit in. And we wanted to highlight that we had a lot of amazing programs here at Compton College, mostly STEM and esports. So we began to do structured campus tours where we brought their students on campus. I them envision what it looked like to be on a college campus and to be sitting in a college classroom. For some students, they identified that esports was the main reason why they would choose to come to Compton because <laughs> they cannot believe that we have such an updated facility that was so amazing for them to be here. The next thing is that we began to send out um, parent and guardian letters um, from Dr. Perry, who we know that's the send letters. Um, to encourage the students to enroll in spring 2024, and we have done that periodically over the past couple of semesters. And then lastly, we are working on recruitment videos where we want to offer the same level of knowledge and support across different um, populations of students where we are targeting Spanish-speaking families to also receive the same guidance and support there as well. And that concludes my presentation and opens it up for questions. Do you have any questions? I'll start. Um, first of all, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, just a couple of questions overall, and it doesn't have to be too big. Um, what are the different courses offered in the various different versions of the program? So, like, you said when you're taking 12, I'm assuming that's strictly online. You don't have, like, interface with them, so they can basically qualify to take it. Um, for the afternoon college, you mentioned the six feeder schools. So, you know, what schools are those? But, but for any of these, what are the core courses that, that the students are taking, um, which is really great with these numbers. And then the, the, the other question was when you saw the performance uh, consistently by gender and ethnicity, I think on page 24, for those students who are in dual enrollment versus our traditional, quote unquote, traditional content college population, what might you attribute that to, right? Is it class size? Is it what? Um, so again, not for right now, I'm just gonna leave it um, I can see your first question I can answer. So students, again, do have the opportunity to take any class that they choose um, as long as it's not a physical education course, right? So for our regular K-12 students, they largely make up a lot of our numbers because these students can participate in any course, even if they're an AP 288 student, if they're a student taking after in college, right? So a student can hold multiple different identities with our dual enrollment programs. Once a student starts that AP 288 pathway, right, where they're taking those high school classes during their regular high school site, the student can still decide to take classes through afternoon college, and they can even go an extra step where they decide to take classes either over the weekend, right, where they may come onto campus or take those classes online. So again, it really, um, it really comes down to what the student is interested in. We've seen a lot of requests for students taking maybe Math 180 or even things like geology. It's pretty much that sparked their interest. So if it's something that's offered outside of the regular high school day, then they're going around or asking our dual enrollment specialist to help them find a class that fits either their needs or their interests. Because our campus could offer a set of courses and they can go above and beyond and take extra courses. And only one program that I, I remember, I think, was closed. That's CAMS, right? We make Compton Early College. Compton Early College. And the AB288, um, if they are in the cohort based program, then they can take classes in the cohort, but they can also take classes throughout the college. Mm -hmm. And then to your second point for success and retention. I do think that majority of the success and retention is because, again, our dual enrollment specialists do have a very special position, and I guess it's the only one in California where we're ensuring that we support our dual enrollment programs through full-time personnel, where, again, they have their weekly site visits, they have agenda items that they discuss with the stakeholders off-site, but then, again, we also have our monthly work group meetings and our partners meetings where we discuss challenges that we may face. 
both technical or instructional, and then we tackle those challenges head on to see where can we move forward to or where can we update some of those curriculum as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, issue, but it would be good um, for the party maybe for a future conversation to see where some of those services and support more frequency, whatever we see is the differentiator. Um, we have wonderful street support already, but just to see what they can do for you. We implemented a customer service survey where we highlighted the main roles in my office. From there, that customer service survey highlights the role of the dual enrollment specialist as well as provides students that are filling out the survey a comment box saying, This person supported me with so and so, I found this beneficial, or seeing what is the actual support that led them to succeed either in their course or in their program. So we can provide you with your program review next to on December. <laughs> and you'll get a letter about that. No, no, no. Thank you. Yeah, um, so regular K through 12, that means um, students outside of like one with unified, um, unified, or what more, what does that mean? So again, the regular K through 12 is any student that is taking any Compton College course, um, as long as it's not physical education. Thank you, Heather, and thank you for putting up this slide. But again, the main takeaway is that a student can be an 8288 student as well as an academic college student and as a regular K through 12 student. There is unit limitations for every individual courses. Um, once a student um does position to take 12 units or over, then they do assume fees and all other um costs associated, which is why we tend to keep them at either unit and under. And is are are we making it somehow like accessible for like let's say residents that live within Compton Unified, Glenwood Unified, but their children go to a parochial school or they, they take their kids where they can be to work. Like mm -hmm. so we do have students enrolled. Yes, and I can actually um let you know um today I responded to five different um high schools that want to start a dual enrollment program. So the converter will be getting a lot of those many <laughs> requests. Um but they largely represent like some Catholic schools, charter local charter schools in the area or even other high schools that we may not um be accepting right now. One thing that I'm also doing is working on the back end and seeing where some of these applications are coming in so that if we see that we have theater areas that maybe we don't have some of these MOUs with or the data sharing agreement, see how we can tackle them because we are seeing such high registration and stuff as well. I, I think uh, I was kind of interested in the sale of things this time. But um, <laughs> I, I, I think. Uh, Trustee Roman, so I think that's a, a place where your question is where I see expansion of dual enrollment as a potential opportunity. Is how you work with K 12 students who live in the district but go to school outside the district. Mm -hmm. And what does that look like? And what is the strategy to encourage those students to go and do the enrollment? And I think that's a potential growth area for us as based to dual enrollment. But the question is going to be how you think how you find the sweet spot. One is how you target well, so how you target those students. Is it through uh, district mailing or district for promotion to residents about the enrollment for students outside of our district? But I do see that as a potential growth opportunity in the future. Mm -hmm. At the very least, the school at one time, students who were in the district went home to the company promise, like they could not take the classes or they weren't funded. Yeah, that was to be a part of the problem when we first started. It was, you had to be a, a graduate from our uh, first time student. From one of our local high schools and take that policy right. and we open that up. But I just do see that with the dual enrollment uh, possibility, we do have some students who don't go to school within uh, K 12 school districts or even private schools in our district. So, how are you able to as a, recruit as an individual and get them to work with their high school with the form completed with the ability to take classes? I do see that as an opportunity, not only for dual enrollment in our district, but also statewide and nationally, because you have some students who are willing to bust out, right? And yeah, some students whose parents will take them someplace else. So how do you encourage those to be dual enrollment, especially when you have the online option for them to go? So I do see that as a potential goal. I don't know how to look structurally of how you provide that support because it's it's a, it's a little random, right? And so how do you provide that support to students uh, who are uh, who might be able to stay who live in the district with two hours school, uh take the district with <clears throat> Yeah. 
One thing that I do want to highlight is that um, I, myself, as an individual in the role, make sure every single student is accounted. So when I tell you I check every single student's registration, I really do. No, that's good. It's evident. Yeah. You can see your passion for what you're doing. And thank you for the listen, uh, my friends. Thank you for helping her and assisting her with everything that she's doing. That was a school that I gave to Dr. Curry. Was it a meal? What was it? What did you do? The dog that she moved in. Animal. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I met that lady at a. And the fifth, mm -hmm. and uh, she said, Well, they're all San Pedro, and they was wondering why they weren't coming to college, college with Europe, they going to Southwest. And they said, Well, we're in the district, we need to come to you guys. So I gave that card to Dr. Curry, so you guys could offer her um, necklace that I'm Oh, okay, good. Yeah, because she, when I told her everything that we offer, she said, You know, you know, I said, Yes, we do. She said, We will. They'll be included in next year's. Right, and that's good. But well, thank you, thank you for your report. Thank you. That was very good. Yeah, good follow up. Yes, indeed. That's what every time I see somebody that's from another school. Student trustee, do you have a question? No, thank you for the lovely report. Thank you. You got another question? Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> do, do we offer courses like to all of our Donald Peter schools or any of them during the summer? Like yeah. that, how does that mm -hmm. so afternoon college is offered to um students again that mark in case that they would attend a summer course which is what then indicates to the high school personnel that they either done an interest survey right so students would be maybe interested in taking child development psychology and stuff like that they submit their formal course request and then from there they are offered that set number of courses so then um we begin recruitment for the summer around april or may um we first tackle with letting the high school partners know that there's an opportunity to have admission application workshops for students who may not have participated in dual enrollment yet we tackle those students first to ensure that when they have their admission applications done that they complete the rest of their dual enrollment process um through the dual enroll system which is now active and then from there follow up um, with it and then registered in those summer courses and then we do have school of participating in winter in the session as well just regarding summer courses do the schools have to give us three times because i know some years back when my kids were they had to first get something signed off before they could come so Title V regulation does state, and it was um, updated recently um, in the past year, that instead of having parents provide that consent um, multiple different times that a student has indicated either a breaking enrollment or dual enrollment courses, we now have officially implemented that the parents only need to do that consent one time or unless they revoke that consent for the student to actively participate in dual enrollment courses. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you. We have one last question. Um, is the Common College Special Resource Center and the director is Allison Brown? Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to share just some information on our department, provide updates on our student data, and just share some program goals. So our mission and vision. So our mission is to ensure equal access to education for students with disabilities by providing support services, accommodations, and advocacy, allowing students to achieve their academic, professional, and personal goals. And our vision is to foster an inclusive and accessible learning environment where all students, regardless of disability, are empowered to participate fully and succeed in their educational journey. So we operate in compliance with several laws and regulations that provide that framework for creating an inclusive and supportive learning environment. So the Americans with Disabilities Act ensures reasonable accommodations and access for students with disabilities. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act ensures that individuals with disabilities are not excluded from benefits of or subjected to discrimination in programs or activities receiving federal financial assistance. And through the RSRC, 
We uh, provide the appropriate accommodations to students with verified disabilities. Section 508 um, focuses on ensuring that technology used by the institution is accessible to students with disabilities. And then Title V of the Educational Codes is what provides the framework for our DSPS programs and um, operations and the guidelines for implementation. And of course, FERPA um, is our confidentiality and um, we place a really high priority on student confidentiality. We'll make sure that we don't disclose disability information um, to anyone except who is qualified to um, have a um, student, of course, can disclose that information if they like to, but we won't do that. Um, all these laws and regulations help to ensure that students who have a verified disability that impacts one or more major life activity resulting in an educational limitation receive equitable access to all educational opportunities. So um, we also see provide support services for students in the following disability categories. So we um, provide services for acquired brain injury, um, attention deficit hyperactivity or ADHD, autism, visual disabilities, deaf and hard of hearing, intellectual disabilities, learning disabilities, mental health disabilities, other health conditions, and physical disabilities. So students apply to the program through, um, we have an AIM portal, which is our database that we hold all of the students' information. It's also where students um, communicate with their instructors and request for services. So they submit their verification, they apply through the AIM portal, and they submit their verification of disability, and then schedule an intake appointment with one of our SRC counselors. The counselor reviews that documentation and utilizes an interactive process with the student to identify any educational limitations and then approve the corresponding accommodations to ensure that they have that access to educational programs, services, and activities that allow them to participate fully and succeed in their academic journey. Um, these accommodations um, that a student may receive are listed here. Um, some of the most common accommodations used tend to be priority enrollment, uh, testing accommodations, and note-taking assistance, which is often um, through the use of assistive technology. Um, the most common services that we um, have are um, academic counseling. So our counselors help students create their educational plans, uh, transfer, um, testing accommodation or disability management um, and uh, the high tech center um, where they learn how to use assistive technology. But it does say personal counseling up there, but um, really that's just a very small part. If a student comes into our office and is experiencing mental health issues, we always like to connect them to any jobs where they can have access to a um, therapist. Um, so here's some examples of our assistive technology that we have available. So we have the Read and Write, which is a literary soft software, um, and this actually is on computers throughout the camp throughout the college. Um, Kurzweil is also a like text to speech. Um, all the students are able to upload like textbooks, and it will read to them, and they can follow along. And it highlights what they're reading, so it supports their reading comprehension. Um, Glean is a is a note taking app. Um, and it's constantly evolving, but it provides students with audio and written transcript of class notes. What's really cool too about Glean, they recently added um, um, video so that students in STEM classes are able to kind of write in uh, like the formulas or you know, different chemistry symbols that are harder to pick up through audio. They also um, have a um, AI that generates test questions based on the material that's been recorded so that they can test where they are in their class and if they're ready for their exams. Um, we have additional um, assistive technology in the, in the computer lab. We have different screen readers and magnifiers for students who might have more visual. Um, we have some other like assistive listening devices and things like that. Um, available. And then the Ubi Duo is another a communication device for students who are deaf and hard of hearing. Um, basically what it is, it looks like a laptop when you open it up, it has a dual um, um, keyboard so that um, individuals can talk to each other through typing some of the instant chat. 
And we have that stationed in our office, but also in some other key locations like the Welcome Center, and um, it's available for like financial aid and admissions and records as well. Some of our activities that we've done over the year, um, we have um, education uh, classes or educational development courses, 37 and 38, um, which support students who are um, taking or interested in increasing their skills in English and math. Um, we have our Road to Transition event for high school students interested in pursuing higher education. So um, that helps them to be able to come to campus and um, gives them that sense of belonging and connection before they even enroll in college. So they're able to meet some of our staff, get a tour of the campus, um, see what resources are available for them. Um, in the summer, we do our SRC 101, which um, was designed to first for students entering college for the first time or um, just to be uh, prepared for the access of college and utilizing our aim and their what accommodations that they're um, entitled to and how to use them and <laughs> advocacy. And um, so we just go over a lot of that. Also, some time management and other tips just to get ready for the semester. Um, we've hosted priority registration clinics this year um, so that we can be have our counselors on hand to help students to enroll in their classes during the priority registration um, appointments. And we've also hosted some different study skills and our advisory board meeting. Um, so we're looking to always get more workshops to address the students' needs. Um, looking at our student engagement, um, over the past academic year, we had an 86% attendance rate with 953 appointments attended. Um, counseling, educational plans, and intakes were the most common appointment reason codes. And additionally, 832 accommodation requests committed. So when um, students are approved for those accommodations, it's their responsibility to um, trigger that letter in their AIM portal so that it goes to their um, the faculty so that they're aware of what accommodations they um, are approved to receive. Um, we also have been doing high school outreach. Um, so we started that in the fall semester and we will continue that into the spring. Um, we just wanna make sure we're creating a smooth transition for students from high school to college. And there's a lot of differences between their accommodations that they receive and how they receive them. Um, so we want to make sure that they're prepare, prepared for that. And so looking at our student counts, so you can see over the past five years that our numbers are um, pretty much in, back to where they were um, pre-COVID. Um, so uh, the highest percentage of students fall into our learning disabilities mental health and other health conditions category. Um, however, we have seen an increased number over the past years in our autism and ADHD categories. You can see they kind of have mirrored each other in their growth. Um, students are predominantly um, Hispanic and African-American. And um, we continue to see a high number of female than male students. And the majority of students are, as you can see, in the 18 to the 24 age group, although we do see a little rise um, in the 50 plus as well. So we're seeing the student success rate increase each year. However, um, retention rate hasn't been as high. Um, and we see the students are also withdrawing from courses. Um, the dashboard, the yeah, dashboard also showed that a lower number of SRC students are obtaining degrees and certificates. But the certificate awards and um, um, associate degrees for transfers are increasing. Um, and in this chart, we can see that Hispanic students have higher completion rates. And except for 2021, female students are completing degrees and certificates in a higher number than male. So as we look over um, the data, yeah. um, the SRC has been able to develop some program mm -hmm. goals to address uh, areas. Um, so increase our high school outreach. One of the areas we've also been um, getting requests for is for parents. 
So um, we're going to start doing some parent information sessions because that transition from high school to college is also a transition and adjustment for parents as well. So we'll be having our first parent information at least the um, high school in December. Um, we also want to collaborate more with educational partnerships because as um, Ben just mentioned, with new enrollment increasing, um, we still have, we do have students who um, with disabilities who are also taking to enrollment, we want to make sure that they also are receiving their accommodations at the college in their college courses. We want to see increased support efforts with um, partnerships with tutoring center. Um, the success center has partnered with us and has provided some tutors that work in our office. So students are able to get that extended tutoring time with, with the tutor and just be able to be in our office. Um, and we have different community partnerships. Um, we have a a representative, a counselor from the Department of Rehabilitation that comes to campus every week and opens up cases or just touches base with our students um, in our office. Um, and we also, we're looking to expand. We have other uh, educational development classes that we're not utilizing. But in addition to that, one thing we are doing is um, our educational development classes have been online. And in the spring semester, we're bringing them to campus. So they'll be more in person, which I think will have um, will be a more beneficial for our students and their learning modality. Um, and we want to increase the workshops that we've been doing, we've seen, um, just to give the uh, students that support. Uh, Re-engagement efforts also, we want to kind of survey the students and find out, um, reach out to those students who are close to the degree and kind of find out what's been going on so we can know how to address them and hopefully bring them back to campus. Um, and just collaborations for that transfer and career readiness with the Career Transfer Center, Workforce Development, College Board, and CTV programs. And um, increased awareness and training across campus um, through collaboration. Uh, I'm sorry, and increased awareness and training okay. by providing opportunities for faculty and staff on best practices for supporting students with disabilities. Um, we want to continue to support counselors and um, SRC staff through attending professional development opportunities. Um, so one, one area we need to prepare for the vision aligned reporting that is coming um, from the chancellor's office. Uh, so we have our AIM portal where we're able to track the needed data for that vision aligned reporting and to make sure we're ready for that. Um, and make sure all, all that our processes are streamlined. Um, and we'll continue to renew and or update assistive technology, um, as well as offer training to students on the use of different equipment and apps. Uh, we, our AIM um, database is also having a revision or, um, to another version, so we'll be doing that in December. Uh, and lastly, we um, want to work on better soundproofing our um, SRC testing center uh, to ensure it's a distraction reduced environment. And um, also plan to install cameras to increase the integrity of the testing environment. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Um, mainly the last one you did say cameras for for what exactly? For our testing center room. So we make sure that um, we're. Uh, we want to make sure that faculty feel comfortable um, having the students test in our office and just make sure we're protecting the integrity of the testing when we're proctoring. No, I love the idea of the sound from the um, yeah. yeah, thank you for your feedback. Yeah, thank you so much for the presentation and for really outlining like the vast services just in the future, but what's and how what kind of categories of uh, Abilities, disabilities, or assistance that we're seeing, and um, one faction is not being able to hang up to see very qualitative conversation or any way we wish to find out. Thank you. I got to hear from you. I wanted to say thank you for the presentation and for very comprehensive. The, the only question I have is. At, at the Special Resource Center, do, do you have like a, 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 a space like do the, the, the students that like utilize these resources, 
Do they have a, a space there or somewhere where they could just like they, they, they I guess pass the time study or something? They they, they don't want to be bombarded with you know, the the rest of the campus activities. Sure, um, we do have our high tech computer lab, so um, we have about um ten computers in the lab. So we do have all students come in all the time, um, and just work in there. And um, we do have some desk spaces too, where they can just kind of uh, spread out their textbooks and study there as well. So there are some spaces available. Um, then we have some other computers that are available for um, students who might have more visual needs. Um, that those computers have more um, like Zoom text, so that it has enlarged um, screen, not screen, but the material on it is enlarged for them. So, so yes, there is. And then we have a tutoring room where there's, so if it's not being used for tutoring, students can go in there as well and study. Thank you. Uh, Anna, tell me what you're talking about, about Soundproof Detention Center. Is it next to a, another office that's a lot of noise? What, what are you talking about? Yes, so our testing center is within our, our SRC office, um, and it uh, has like windows around it. Um, but what we found is that we can actually hear, um, we're right next to educational partnerships, and a lot of times we can hear them on the other side of the wall. So um, we're look, looking into, um, there's just like little sound, soundproofing squares that you can like, put on the back of the wall. Um, and we've also seen some like window, um, because the windows kind of surround the outside close to our high tech lab. So there are some different things you can put on the windows to kind of make them a little bit more sound good. Install test inside a camera system. Tell me what you're talking about. You, you want to put a camera inside the room yeah. to watch them take the test. I heard you made a statement about the safety of the faculty. But okay, that yeah, that, that, no, 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 that's what picked up my ear when you said the safety of the faculty. What, what do you mean by that? Oh, I, did I say that? I did. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. Oh. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not integrity of the, the to um to um, so the faculty feels safe having us talk to their exam. I think is what I meant. So that they sometimes faculty um isn't sure if we're proctoring. So um we just want to make sure that this faculty feels comfortable with um us being able to proctor the exams outside of their classroom because they don't know the job or the uh, no no no. Um, um, I gotta leave this one off. Then you want to ensure the safety of the faculty. More comfort. Is it no no? Is it because of the students or is it because of the environment? Look, I don't, I'm lost. I the safety probably wasn't the right word. Um, they're more to, to make sure faculty is comfortable having their students test outside of their classroom environment. That they know that we are going to uphold the integrity of their testing. Um, their examinations by um, making sure that we're proctoring the exams to the highest. Um, yeah, yeah. So I got it. I'm a proctor. I'm a proctor for the state bar. Okay, so and and we have we have people that take the state bar test that are just like that. This next year, oh, we all of that. Yeah. And so. Well, it just got me when you said that because we are in a room with two people or either one person and one could be ADHD and the other one could be not ADHD but they're taking that test they're the same with them together but I would think that you would say the same thing that well and it's your I, I think what you're right, I, I have um, heard situations where too, where the safety of the proctor as well. Um, I have heard of different situations that have happened. Um, so yes, to your point, yes, I agree. That would be a little bit No, thank you. Yeah. I, I wasn't trying to make you nervous or anything, but when you said the safety of the faculty, I kept thinking about what about students? No, you're, I mean, you're absolutely right. Yeah, thank you. I could say, are the, is faculty adept at being Acting as a proctor when given the test. This, so you said you want. Oh, you know, well, I, I, yeah. I mean, I can. We, we have to follow back up on that question. I, I, I think the concern 
in regards to testing and testing outside the classroom to really any concerns that faculty might have regards to their test being proctored in another area for the faculty or not in that one. But we'll follow back up on that question and also that to next steps. Okay. I just said I'm going to leave it alone. <laughs> no, I, I, do, I, do, I do think it warrants a follow up to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are now at we are at consent agenda. Dr. Perry. Oh wait a minute. Sorry. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. by Dr. Little, second by. Trustee Ramos, uh, Dr. Curry, are there any revisions to the consent agenda? No, there's not. Trustees, do you have any consent items that you want to discuss or to be pulled or take to be discussed and stay on it? Then we can still vote for it all we want. No, it's not. Uh, Trustee Thomas, I mean, student Trustee Thomas. No, ma'am. No. Dr. Little? No. Trustee Ramos? And none for you? No. Welcome. I mean, uh, okay. mm -hmm. All right. So now we are at thirteen action items. Thirteen oh one, administrative services, county committee, college district resolution number eleven nineteen eleven dash nineteen dash twenty twenty four a, budget transfers augmentations for fiscal year twenty twenty four to twenty twenty five. So moved. Second. Do we have any discussion, Student Trustee Thomas? No discussion. Doctor Lodell, thank you. Trustee Rogers. No discussion. No discussion. <laughs> All right, y'all. I can tell my energy is gone. I'm sorry. <laughs> May we have the thank you so much. It's okay. <laughs> We're getting there. Yes, <laughs> All right, 1302, Administrative Services, Proposition 30. So moved. All right, thank you. Second. Are there any uh, discussions? Student Trustee Thomas? No. No, ma'am. Dr. Little? No question. Rubble? No. None for me? Place your online vote. Unanimous yes vote. 1303 Administrative Services Contracts over 114,500. Oh. <laughs> County Community College District Resolution Number 11 19 2024 B CBE Office Solutions Sharp Electronics Corporation. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Do we have any discussion? Trustee Thomas? No, ma'am. No, no. Dr. Little? One quick question. Okay. Um, Dr. Curry, for the lease agreement, how, how many years and what is it all covered? It's for the next five years, and it covers all our printers and copy machines in all areas except for the print shop. How many print, printers are in the print shop? Like, like is it how many? Like, the total number, I'm sure, is in here. I just can't remember it. No. The print shop is not included. No, I'm saying how many? Yeah. How many machines total? Mine is the print shop machine. Uh, it's included in the order. And that maintenance and all that. Yeah, everything's included. But you're saying five years. Yeah, it's a five year agreement. Is that customary time frame? Correct. I know it's a five year agreement. I'm yeah, the last one we had five years and we kept it. We, we extended it. And so the staff went there. Yeah. The so the staff went, uh, actually, Mike Simmons was our chief uh, technology officer, was working with uh, Randy 
uh, in his office for the last several months. You need quotes and move the different firms. And you have a copy of the, uh, the bids that were submitted. And so that gives you an order form of the number of machines that we have. Okay. Um, sorry, the, uh, the, the quantities are to the left, right? Right. Okay. 350. Okay. 350. Okay. 400, 430? No. No, no, no. Some of them are just finishing. It's about 170 units. Oh, 170. Uh, those are talking about finishing and all that. So. So if I did the math, 107 for 650,000. So that's about average. There's also a sheet with prices. Okay. It's, 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 okay. I'm just thinking in five more years, you're going to have to have that same signature or more. Okay. So that's yeah, it. but we, we're actually on the same. Right. Not doing it for what you said. That's how we've been doing. We've been, yeah. we've been, when I first arrived in this position, we had to. We had no, the, the printers were not organized under one company. So you had different departments printing and they used different types of printers. And so that's when we had a contract with Xerox. Now, this was a new contract with Sharp, which was a better deal than what Xerox was made to offer. And so they were replaced with the Xerox machines with their machines. And we're excited about this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thirteen oh four. Administrative services contracts are one hundred fourteen thousand five hundred. Oh, okay. Oh. Do we have any discussion? Trustee Thomas. Student Trustee Thomas. Um, this yes. is thirteen oh four. Yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm I'm here. Um, will that be extended hours? No, so this we have a mental health contract with them. We were a part of the uh, program they offer in regards to mental health, and they're providing a twenty thousand dollar grant to the college. So what that grant will be able to do help be able to support some programming. So we got ten thousand dollars to make two payments of ten thousand dollars. So this is actually increased the contract was one hundred fifteen thousand that we were paying for. It actually gave us twenty thousand dollars for us for participating in the bid Thank you. Dr. Little. So it's just, just to clarify, it's for the December 13th event? Yes. For the, I know, I'm sorry. It was for the October 19th event. And December 13th. Oh, okay. yeah, no, the first event was October 19th, and the second event was December, December 13th. Okay. Right, thank you. Trustee Ramos. Well, Thirteen oh five, Dr. Curry. So this is a contract. Uh, I just it. So as as you know that uh, Common College will be the first to work through this contract to be able to have student housing built on our campus. And so we went out to bid, um, and the bids came in in late October, and we want to award the bid as the lowest responsible bidder to Bernard Brothers uh, for this contract. The goal is to get the project completed by 2027, and the amount is not to exceed $65.719 million for this project. And the goal is for the project to be done on time and on budget. And I recommend it. So Do we have a discussion? Trust, student trustee Thomas? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> we, we talk enough about it. I don't have any questions. I just want to know. Okay. Dr. Little. Um, just really quickly, they're referred to as an employee owned company. Do we have any more data 
Their representatives are here to ask that question. Oh, are you? I oh, I think we can have a co op. Can you stand up and introduce yourself at the podium, please? Hi, my name is Tom, I'm director of business development prior to Chief Ken for Bernard. And Cameron here is also our executive. Now, what was your question? To clarify, what is employee owned? What, what do you all consider that to mean? And what is where you get about it? So your ownership or leadership? So our, our company employee owned me, every single employee that's employed by Bernard's um, has ownership and shares in the company. Mm -hmm. So it is, it's about seven years um, turned over to the employees. It used to be owned by three brothers, the Bernard brother. Um, seven years ago, they decided to retire. And instead of selling the company, they sold it uh, to the employees. Mm -hmm. So every year we get shares in the company based off of um, projects and uh, profitability, uh, positions, and um, bonuses. I would accept it as me. Oh, we're all We're all We're all you don't have any data on gender or ethnicity. I, I could get you that exact information. Um, I would say we are an extremely diverse company. Um, and, and I would say it occurred naturally. Um, but we'll definitely share that information. We have a separate division for that. So we have the data available. Great. No other questions. It definitely enhanced yeah. uh, they were not all for me. I didn't know who they were. <laughs> 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 they were engaged about how they're going to build our housing and their company on the Marty Meyer. Don't be offended. And then just to answer this. One is the 65, 70, 49, but there's a lot of them. Yeah, so, but, yeah, so but, the yeah, but I'll also say that um, the project as, as noted in the board is funded with the student affordability, affordable student housing mm -hmm. funds for the state. Mm -hmm. And so this is a part of the grant program that the district applied for and received $80.3 million to support uh, this project. So it's not being paid for with bond funds, local bond dollars. And so that's a misconception that you know, some of the business is going to be. So I think it's important. Yeah. And it's also important to note that we're um, student affordable housing. That's just the key word, affordable. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of other institutions in our county where students are not being able to return the next semester strictly because of housing yes because yeah. they just cannot afford it mm -hmm. we already know about the unhoused and it may not necessarily be outside but you know couch surfing sleeping in one's car so i think again to dr curry's point about the source of the money but the pool of the beneficiary of this housing i think mean, it needs to continue to clarify mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Pleasure online, go. Would that be an yes vote? Would that be an unanimous yes? When do we bring friends? <laughs> <laughs> I may speak to the trustees. So there's, awesome, awesome. <laughs> uh, we're, 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 there's some, we have to do a couple of things with our insurance company to bring that contract to board. So I'm hopeful sometime in December we do groundbreaking, if not early January. But they will be mobilizing in sometime in December. Awesome. So work will be starting in December. That's right. Great. 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 No change orders. <laughs> yeah, no, sure, no override. No override. I'm sure we'll be looking for. <laughs>
people know is a responsible bidder. Well, it's going to just for them to get it done right because that's how they get paid. That's true. <laughs> so, thank you. Guys. Oh, 1306. Yeah. Facilities, planning, and development contracts over 114500 Okay, Noble something and inspection services. <laughs> SoCal DBA Universal Engineering Sciences. Come on. Do we have any discussion? Trustee no. Student trustee no. I mean, I'm just trying to click on it. This 1306. I, I, I'm, oh. Yeah. oh, I know you are. Yeah. No, no questions. Okay. Dr. Lou? No question. Ah. No question, but just to put this is a consultant, yeah. This as we inspections, yeah. Okay, around the inspection, so they'll partner with our building or uh, I think they're your partner the team that works on the site, and so I believe they're part of the inspection, but it's an additional line, additional item. Cost, yes. so additional right. cost, separate cost, and that's customary, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's budget with the student affordability, the student budget with the state affordability, affordable student housing authority. Okay. Is required. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thirteen oh seven facilities planning and development contracts over one hundred fourteen thousand five hundred. The Anaheim Group T A G. Can I have a motion? Second. Do we have any discussions? Do you trust me, Tom? Dr. Look, which one are they independent from? Again, the team is another consultant team. Correct. And then it says as needed throughout. So it's just the different phases as we get to the different phases of inspections. Yeah, but it's our inspector director who has to sign off on the project. And so they have to inspect on site as construction did. Okay, so it's over the, the year. This 624 is over the year. 624 is over the year. Okay. Trustee Rose. Trustee Rose. Trustee Rose. Trustee Rose. Trustee Rose. Trustee Rose. Trustee Facilities planning and development contracts of 114500 This is the amendment. Increased construction, Inc. Instructional building number two. Project amendment number five. So moved. Do we have any discussions? Student Trustee Thomas? No discussions. Dr. Little? Yeah. Good question. Obviously, yeah. we're switching services. This is yet another amendment tied back to. What we, we we just passed. You have cover for runovers where we can uh, yeah. in the housing yeah. project. Yeah. No, we yeah, we have we have some money set aside for over at least to that project. This one is relates to our social building too, as we try to fold out the building. And so our goal is to cope with it completed by the same thing first. Um, but this is one of our projects that was that we had issues in regards to uh, timing and condition. This, but we do have money set aside in the budget for the housing in regards to uh, the project that goes over. I've instructed the staff to give them a number what the budget is, and we're going to monitor that budget. And our goal is not to go over it. The key is that the project, the student housing, has to be completed on time, and the orders have to be done in a timely manner. Okay, so that was my question in terms of risk management that we have in our contract coverage to where not just the financial, but if it does not, then we have remedy. Like if we cut the money or something is renegotiated. There, 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 there is, I would say renegotiated, but I, I would say there's protection in regards to insurance, and there also is the protection in regards to the construction firm having a bond as well. Uh, but the goal is to make sure that everyone understands the budget. And also understand that we, we don't want to see change orders as they see the project and really hold individuals accountable. And so with this project, we have a fixed number of what the budget is. And we have to monitor that budget 
And we can't, uh, we can't anticipate there's going to be additional funds because our funds that we see the state is one number. And I'll be talking about that at this special action item regards to what the state wants to do with this housing. So it's a fixed number. Well, can we say I five and 15 and then thank you so much. No more. No further questions. Well, <laughs> no place y'all want to go. Please. Yes, folks. Okay, 14 discussion slash action. 1401. Oh, Dr. Craig, don't be doing the discussion. Okay, thank you. So, this is the yearly item that we're working on for the Board of Trustees as it relates to board meetings for the 2025 year. We included uh, the calendar of uh, holidays and also we gave the schedules of what these might look like for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Uh, in the month of January, February, there's some changes because of those of dates and holidays, and they're trying to work through that. Uh, but we provide that for the board of trustees to review when, at the next point of meeting. The board has to select a day, uh, days for the regular schedule meeting. We also put days in for the retreat uh, for the board of trustees to take into account respect to retreat for a week. And so we looked at Monday to retreat, um, and also uh, for the schedule in the winter and also in the summertime. And so that's here for the information for the board. And we're bringing back next month for discussion. There's no discussion before that. Okay. No, it's late. I discussed it next month. Next month. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Item 14.02 is a draft of the Board of Trustees presentation and report schedule. Uh, we're trying to you know, keep the reports presentations to two a meeting. Uh, tonight is three because of the Donna trip. Now the requirement of, of the Donna trip was to be able to give presentation to the board. But we're trying, we're working on a presentation to try to keep it to two per meeting um, and really just really look at what presentation we can report to the board and also what reports. So just give you a draft of the reports and presentation for next year. There's some specifically that the board would like to see through the know and we'll talk about it for next morning. Senator Curry, April, Julian, September got three reports. Actually, so we know that not all funds can, and even the federal recommendation. So April, April, you have the budget workshop. So you have a presentation on the on the on the AG. You have a, a goals from here, and the goals and the budget workshop are actually together. Okay. And then June, you have the facilities master plan. You have a tenant budget, and yet you have a presentation on eighty seven on crime. Okay. And September, that's September just a, is a, the final budget presentation, oh, okay. but a public hearing is not a presentation. Okay, right. Item 14.03, as we prepare for our, our meetings with our different elected officials, we have our report cards for, at the last month, we have a report card for trusted areas. Now we have the Assembly, Congressional, State Senate, and also supervisory. Uh, uh, report cards with their data. So this is going to be prepared for our meetings and with the list of meetings that are happening in January. 1404 is our conference of master plan. Also include our mission statement for the college. Uh, I do want to say thank you to Amari Williams for leading this effort as the Dean of Institutional Effectiveness. Uh, our goal is to bring back the uh, another draft of the document for approval. There will be some modifications to this document. Uh, regards to uh, some of the goals, just some clarification with regards to language that's being utilized, but also our facilities master plan. Uh, one, one change that we're recommending is instead of the health, the, the, the community health center being located where the current gym is at, was actually moving to parking lot A at the entrance of campus, so that the community could be able to walk on the campus to be able to utilize that facility, but then also looking at extra parking but where the current division is that instead of having the community health center there, there's be a just be a parking lot, but also give a space for potential new growth. So that's one change in the No, no, no. Let me think about it. Uh, item fourteen point zero five. This one is very important. We've been working a lot with the uh, Department of Finance, the California Community College Chancellor's Office, in regards to student housing. So it's just to give you a sense. 
what this means. So this, I will provide you with the background information about the student, student housing and, and the funding for the grant program that compensated for this family. However, uh, in, in, due to the state budget and the deficit, uh, the state shifted the financing for the approved projects to a local, at least revenue funds. So we are receiving the $80.3 million for our projects. So at some point uh, this year, the state would do a switch. They would say, we give you your balance that you have remaining, and then we give another set of cash to support the project and be paid off. However, the state will be paying back that money from a bond. So the state will borrow money for to complete all the uh, student housing projects. Compton will be at to turn some money in based on the rent construction. They give us that money back in cash from the bond. However, in order to do that, we have to have a lease, uh, we have to have a, a lease agreement with the state as it relates to uh, the student housing facility. And so we've been working with the Department of Finance, the California Community College Chancellor Office, what that might look like. The one issue that we have right now uh, as it relates to this is that we have to renegotiate our contract with Major League Baseball because in their contract, there's a bill, it's the language change. Where we talk about the Carpenter Community College District premises, the premises for student housing will actually be leased out to the state chancellor's office. So we need to exclude that area from student housing from the agreement that we have in Major League Baseball. And so we work with our legal counsel on that part to get that language included in that amendment for Major League Baseball. And I've never Major League Baseball this morning, and they have a better understanding how that works. And our goal is to bring that back forward sometime in January or February of 2025. So it just changes the way funding is done for student housing. What's the time frame when we give the money back and we give it back? I have no idea. It's not going to delay. I have no idea. So we and, and here's the thing is that they're still trying to they're working through this process and this has been happening for over a year and they're trying to work through this process. The good part about it is we don't have the cash again. And so you know my joke that I told the Department of Finance is that we might finish the project by the time they want to switch the money, right? Mm -hmm. But that was a joke. Mm -hmm. I don't know. They're timely because there's a lot of things that they've worked through of how this will work. And so the, the part that they asked us for was about the maybe baseball contract. And so that was an engagement that we had with them a couple of weeks ago regards to next steps. So we're trying to we try to solidify that with maybe baseball. But we'll have the money in hand so we can pay our bills and keep our Correct. project. That's 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 where we're at. We're not gonna give money back while we're we're, we're gonna continue to make sure bills are being paid. And so we'll continue to watch the cash flow. On the projects, so we get money back and watch the cash flow to make sure everyone's getting paid. And, and Major League Baseball did not ask us to um, renew their contract or extend their contract. Major League Baseball, we're gonna, at this moment, we're not in a position to, re to renegotiate their contract. The runs until 2028. All we're looking at is looking at our current agreement okay. regards to the work premise and what is the site for them. And because it says come to me about digital premise, okay. uh, we're, we're saying that that once area. Is not included in that contract. Okay. Just want to make sure because sometimes we never move on. Thank you. Just want to make sure you have that information. Yeah. We also provide you an update on our common college enrollment of uh, 14.06. We today we had a campus wide meeting. We talked about enrollment. You can see our enrollment continue to increase. Uh, we're doing very well uh, this semester. We're also doing well for winter. It's, uh, Dr. Berger talks about the spring data because the numbers are significantly increased over 500%, but the cost of that uh, compared to last year at this time, when we started with space and seats earlier. And so um, we're looking good for enrollment, but we have to continue to push as we move forward. I'm really excited about our enrollment management plans. Uh, we set aside $100,000 for enrollment management. Uh, those plans are, are projects that people would like to implement and send it to who we are be by this Thursday. But in the item, in the board item, you have the updated enrollment information in the college. You also have our five-year FTS there is there as well. We provide a lot of information to you, and we also provide information to you as well. We've got some call center, outreach at events, uh, all that information is there. Any questions? No. Go ahead. Item 14.07 uh, for the Board of Trustees. This is just our updated five-year uh, fiscal management plan. Which we have been shared with the Planning and Budget Committee and also Consultant Council. This gives you a sense of where we're at budget wise for the next five years. As a board of trustees, you know, we really monitor our budgets for the next five years. I just want you to know what's included in the plan, uh, what that the, the, some, some assumptions. We do assume that we will not be receiving cost of living adjustments for 26, 27 onwards due to the funding floor for California Community Colleges. 
No negotiated related items are included in the budget projection as related to expenditures. It does include withdrawal from our other post employee benefits, uh, but tourist uh, entity uh, investment trust in 2045, and also for our purchase storage in 2045 and 2526. We continue to monitor our five year budget and we continue to update as well. You can receive more information from the state of California as well as to our budget. But I think it's very important for everyone to know that this is not only a accreditation requirement in regards to looking at five year projections, mm -hmm. this is good for the district to continue looking at five year projections. When you're looking at staffing, you look at potential expenditures, it's something that the board has to monitor as a part of the fiduciary responsibility as well um, for the district to make sure that we gain fiscal solid. And so we really monitor this all the time. We look at it all the time. And I feel like every other month, actually every month, there's always some type of updates that we're doing for the five year budget. Is there any questions? No. I have a 15.01 15 15 15 that's you. Oh, okay. Grant items. Administrative services grant, whatever that is, Shabbat, lost post office. That's in the last Oh, okay. Thank you. Out in community college district, lost procedure. Okay. On behalf of the California Department of Social Services, California Early Childhood Mentor Program, CECMP grant number 23 303099. So moved. Second. Do we have any discussions? to Trustee Thomas. Dr. Little? No. Trustee Ramos, I know I'm going to get that name better. I'll be thinking of Poseidon. <laughs> Poseidon, <laughs> Nature, this name. I don't know it all the way up. No questions, <laughs> either. I'm going to get some drums. I'm going to get some drums. I'm sorry, yeah. Oh, wake us up. Wow. That's a unanimous yes. Okay, 1502 Administrative Services Grant Digital Promise Global. Can I get a motion? I move. Second. Do we have any discussion? Student Trustee Thomas? Um, no discussion. Dr. Little? No discussion. Just a quick question. We will get the data year to year, right, for participation in this pilot? Yeah, we can work Okay. Trustee Ramos? Yeah. Okay, board policies and administrative regulations. Dr. Curry will discuss the teachers. So, you know, Dr. I say, do anybody have anything to say about 60 or one through such and such, such? Or do you have to go to each one? I can just highlight a couple of the quite up here. Yes, please. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to buy. I just want to highlight a couple more policies. First of all, thank you to the faculty staff and also administrators, uh, mostly uh, Dr. Sherry Berger and uh, Sylvia and Elizabeth that work heavily on this. Items in uh, board policy six, uh, 1602 regards the district. This is just a, a review uh, for us what we're doing regards the district for first reading. This is a review of our po policy for the district and name of those changes. Board policy uh, 60.03, board policy 1200, our mission. This, we cleaned up this board policy. There's going to be some additional board, a, a, new, a new board policy associated with this one, would be board policy 1201, would be our strategic initiatives. But this one's a clean up, so you see our new mission and also our vision for this teaching is included from the college. Uh, 6104, please put a record and a note that Trustee Calhoun did submit questions and her question is presented in the back of the room. Uh, so that's uh, outlined as other minutes. But board policy 6104, we updated the board of duties and responsibilities, added information from the board uh, from CCLC template in place to that as well. Uh, also, too, we have other board policies 
uh, that are coming forward. But I think the one I want to highlight before I give up the mic is uh, Board Policy 3715 regards to intellectual property. We will be a staff to the task force with our different constituent groups to be looking at the uh, procedures in accordance with the accordance with the board policy 3715. And we're very, very much on top of our board policy. Question, like, you know, the are you talking about faculty IP? I'm talking about faculty and it's yeah, it includes faculty and also students. So we're but we had to work on the, the board policy talks about the procedure that brings in all stakeholders as to what that procedure looks like. <laughs> and that's I put the board policy section. Oh, one small thing mm -hmm. for the mission is that mission statement done? Yes. yes. Is there any change? Right. Is there any change that the board is looking to make to the So I was just saying, the vision speaks to student learning and success. The, the first sentence of the the vision for the first sentence of the mission talks about us adding a resource. I just wanted it to be aligned. But it's been the wish to say that the students have. I don't know. Great. Awesome. But it talks about us being a community resource. Yeah, and so, so the, this has been through uh, countless reviews, including that you said it, but, but the resource was basically looking at like, well, I'm a community resource. Like, think about all the stuff that we brought, the resource we provide to students in our community. And so, um, I actually, I think, I think mean, everyone did a very good job on this. I like it. I just think we do need to prep people when you think about an educational institution that it's a reframing of much broader and I think appropriately broader nuanced understanding of what a community college is. It is a anchor community resource. Mm -hmm. But also when people think about the mission of an educational institution, they generally want to see something like more of a vision where you speak to educational platforms. We do get to it in the text. So it's just a comment, not not a critique at all. Thanks. Yeah. Then we look through the uh, information section. Yes, 18. Yeah, 17. 17. So just one thing I would, would highlight actually too, uh, for the information section is that there's an update on the IW Connor estate. I'm actually going to bring forward to the board probably in January or February an update on the properties and some recommendations as late to the properties and next steps. Uh, we have two properties that uh, will be vacant lots. And we need the we need the direction from the board of what to do with these two properties. One is already been transferred, and the other one will be transferred in the future. So we'll provide an overview of that and think about for development what can potentially be done. But also the direction that I received from the board of trustees was like don't sell property, let's manage the property, and that's what we've been doing. But we want to talk about some next steps in regards to the management of those two properties and the potential development of two, those two properties and what that might look like as we move forward. Uh, and both of those properties are in Linwood. And then also give an update to the board about the value of the state, uh, where it's at right now, the values of the homes, and then also the cash value as well. So my goal is to bring that to the board, hopefully in January or February, of where we're at in regards to the state. We want to provide a presentation to the board on that. Uh, also, too, I want to just highlight that we included a campus police update and also update on the nursing program as well. And then if you take a look at item number 17.21, that's our master schedule for our facilities projects. And that includes the eighteen is all about future agenda items. Yes, yeah, so we're going to have some oral reports at nineteen. Doctor Kerr, I have. Oh, okay. uh, was that supposed to be a vote on it? No. Oh, okay. I'm just moving, please. <laughs> so I have a couple. I have, I have about eight points to go in my oral report. First of all, I would say, I'm joking. Did you see? Did you see? We were like, right? Yeah, the student does. He said, I'm not So I'd like to say thank you to our community for supporting uh, 2024 Measure CC for Common College and Common Community Foundation. We've got to start setting years for all of our bond projects now that we have three. Uh, this will provide us with an opportunity to build and renovate our facilities to meet the needs of our students. Uh, the one thing I'm really proud of was on election day and seeing individuals walking through the, um, the new open area by Trust Number Two 
Uh, it'll just, just it's just a nice reflection for me to see how the quality has come from the road buildings to now when people are able to walk through the campus. And then now I'm also afraid about the new construction projects we got coming up. But we have more projects coming online very soon. I actually thank you to the faculty and classified professionals uh, and managers and supervisors for attending the taste of Thanksgiving that was held on the floor of 2024. Uh, as Felicia Hatton, who works in our mission records department, has said we have come a long way in regards to appetizers from Taste of Thanksgiving to full meals on Thanksgiving. It was nice to see people being able to fellowship and uh, have a good time uh, having Thanksgiving uh, lunch uh, together. On Wednesday, uh, December 11th, we will hold the fall 2024 nursing pay ceremony at 6 o'clock p.m. in Jamaica. We'll send an email and a calendar here back to the board. Hope you're able to attend this uh, wonderful celebration of our nursing graduates. Uh, we have seats for those stage as well, but it's on Wednesday, December 11th, 2024 at 6 o'clock p.m. I also want to say thank you to everyone that attended the uh, grand opening ceremony for Structural Building 1 and 2. It was a long time coming. It was cold, but it was really nice. And I want to say thank you. It was a, we had a nice turnout for the event. I do want to say thank you to um, everyone that was involved in the uh, planning for the event. Uh, it was really nice, and I, I really enjoyed myself, and I hope everyone did as well. On December 10th, uh, from 12 to 2 o'clock, we'll host our annual employee holiday celebration. I'm really excited about that event. That's when we have a lot of opportunity drawings and we have a chance to uh, fellowship before the holiday break. Uh, there will be a student turkey giveaway on Wednesday, uh, November 20th, 24, from 2.30 to 5.30. We have 400 turkeys. Uh, students have to show their ID at the farmer's market to receive a ticket. Students will typically be picked up at the, be able to pick up the turkey at the gymnasium. So now, so we're trying to coordinate events like the farmer market. So not only are you able to get the turkey, but you also have a $20 voucher. You'll be able to buy some fixings and fruits and vegetables and stuff like that as well. And so we think about community resources. We provide a lot of food to support our students because we know that our students are dealing, are dealing with housing and food issues. And that concludes my event. Any questions, Thomas? All righty. So for support amongst thank you for uh, being here today. And thank you for the farmer's market. You know, I have a the farmer's market. Thank you for the food trucks. Thank you for listening to me and implementing the food trucks, even though um, the Mighty Skulls one didn't work out. Thank you for the pizza 360 or whichever one you got coming on Tuesday now. Um, I attended the ACCT um, last month. That conference went well. Um, it was cold out there, too. <laughs> <laughs> the conference went well. Um, I learned a lot. I gained a lot. Um, I feel that um, Compton is doing great work. Um, being in that conference um, kind of let me see what other schools are doing and what they're not doing. Mm -hmm. um, I sat in the mental health um, workshop and um, I sat in the SNAP and uh, Cal Fresh workshop and everything that they're speaking about and that they're trying to have other schools implement, we have um, already going on. So I want to say thank you to Dr. Curry, thank you to the board. And even with that being said, I tried to have more students come to say um, you know, something nice about Compton, what they experienced but time permit and some had to go. So I have one student here left, um, Ms. Denisha Fuller, and she's going to speak to you guys about what she appreciates at Compton College. Since I went to that conference and I, I, I learned so much that Compton is doing so much great work and I'm beating you down the block about, you know, this, this and that. And I want to take time to say thank you um, for the work that you are doing. And we have another student who's going to say thank you as well. So yes, yeah, so that's all I have to say. All right, thank you for yeah. Yes, I had the number one just left. I think I just seen Ashley. Yeah, she had the meeting. Yeah. Hi, I'm Alicia Fuller. I'm the ASG Commissioner of Financial Aid. And when I came to Compton, I had one goal, and that was to get my education so that I could open my own bank here. And uh, in the midst of doing that, I went directly to Dr. Ferguson over at Child Christian, and she told me to become a student worker. Um, becoming a student worker really helped me financially with taking care of my daughter. And um, after that, I ended up going to a um, welcome event where I met Dr. Bateson. He awarded me the opportunity to jo join the Dining Movie Program. And that was an amazing experience where I got to meet um, Ms. Shirley, who's the um, Secretary of State, as well as here in Compton, I got to meet um, Holly Mitchell. And um, I can't even agree, I'm so sorry, but I'm nervous. But I, I had a lot of opportunities to see what student advocacy looked like through that new program, and I really enjoyed that. 
and I decided to join it. You know, she's here in Compton. I feel like that I have everything I need to thrive and survive. And because I take my education seriously, I feel like everybody will take my education seriously too. And it's a, a, a home and family environment. And okay, thank you. Before you go, where did, that, where did you go when you got in the program? You didn't talk about the traffic. Uh, we went to Sacramento to see Shirley, and then we went to uh, Washington to have a debate where I was with other Harvard students and students from the South or whatever. And we were in a, a meeting like this where we represented places in Africa, and I represented Toma, the defense um, section, where we tried to figure out solutions to solve um, security in Toma. And that was amazing. And then um, I had the opportunity to travel. Uh, uh, Detroit, um, Alabama, um, we landed in St. Louis, New York, and I also went to Canada. Okay. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. And you know, the world, is, I mean, we, we hear in an institution to learn, but the world is our educational playground. Yeah, and right. we can learn as much as we can within the book, but when we step out here in the real world, that's when we get the real knowledge. Okay. So I saw all the pictures. She liked Detroit the best. Back at the beginning of a meeting to share. Oh, I am going to bring her back. I'm going to do it again once it's not till nine o'clock. Okay, you guys have a good night. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were eating up all the dust. Right? If I'm opening my problems, that's the problem. I just want to say that I attended the, the building cutting session. It was a great experience. I wanted to thank you. 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 Thank that um, we need to catch him and putting that out there and the, the voters that can be like by a high margin of over two thirds of this year. So I'm excited for what's to come. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone for the meeting and the presentation. And I want to say leadership matters. It matters. It matters. And with everything that goes on, you know, we all have different views of life, but I think we see with the decision making of this administration, our faculty, our staff, um, and the community of our students, it is important for us to recognize, as our student trustee said, that we are blessed to have impact like we just heard from one student, countless students, the, the group that went to Ghana, so many other stakeholders in this community, the dual enrollment, that's transformational for many families. Um, it saves kids two years of college tuition, something we don't even talk about a lot. <laughs> uh, when you start thinking about the impact, and it is unfortunate, now I know personally, it is unfortunate that we can lose sight of what the reason we're here for. So I just want to thank the community for the bond. I want to thank, again, you know, you talk about student housing. Um, people need to look beyond their little backyard. There are a lot of people who don't have housing who get for education, but especially for education, who are trying to contribute <laughs> to the economy of this whole country. So it's very, you know, it's backwards in, in, in many ways to, to, to question that. But at the end of the day, none of this has to be done. <laughs> none of it has to be done. And I just want to thank everyone who worked so diligently and so hard to, to, to keep pushing. Sorry, Marjorie. Um, can I remind you? <laughs> I, I'm saving my stuff for another time, but we did have a great time at the uh, grand opening ribbon cutting. Thank you. Yeah, it was very good. It was it, it was okay, but uh, I just want to say good night. Good night.
Next meeting is next month. Drop the gap. Drop the gap. Enjoy the church. Oh, I'm sorry. The meeting adjourned at 8 40. The next meeting is December. Yeah, thank you.